the White Witch Podcast with me, Carly. Hope you are all well, witches. On today's episode, we're going to be talking all about Cornish witchcraft and the folklore associated with it. I owe a lot to Cornwall. I know I always bang on about this, but through spending a lot of my childhood in Bodmin, I learned all about witch trees, druid circles, frequented the Boscastle Witchcraft Museum. If you're over that way, you have to go. Heard countless tales of Cornish Piskies, the Mermaid of Zena. There is a ton of folklore there to be had. So today I thought I might share some Cornish delights with you too and give you a feel for the land. This episode also coincides with me reading The Black Toad by Gemma Gary, a wonderful, insightful book into Cornish witchcraft, which we will be revisiting on another episode shortly to talk more about the spellcraft side of things. Witches and pellers are not uncommon in the region of Cornwall. A pella is in English folk magic and witchcraft, a healer, diviner and breaker of spells. And the term is probably a corruption of expel, as in the repelling or expelling of spells. A pella would be sought out if a person thought he or she had been bewitched or cursed. But don't worry, we will delve more into that soon on the podcast. Cornwall lies on the southwest tip of the British Isles and is considered by many to be one of the Celtic nations. Trust me, it has its own language. I remember a local farmer talking at me With his herd of cows behind him, I kid you not, when I was a kid, it blew my mind. Obviously, I had no idea what he was talking about, bless him. But the minute you hit the moors, woodlands, streams, the sea in Cornwall, I think it is impossible to not believe in witches, piskies and bookers. And today, that's what we are going to be talking all about. Let's start off with the wonderful tale of the Witch of Trevor, a tale that comes from a hamlet near Zena, which is a small village at the northwest of Cornwall and is adapted from popular romances of the west of England or the droll traditions and superstitions of old Cornwall written by Robert Hunt in 1908. So Trevor is now known in modern day as Truay. The Witch of Trevor. There was once an old woman who was deeply skilled in the arts of necromancy and lived in a tiny hamlet called Trevor in Cornwall. She could make powerful spells, incantations and charms and people in the neighbourhood were terrified of her. Nevertheless, although the local people held her in fear and awe, her husband remained singularly unimpressed by her witchery and refused to believe in such things. Instead, he was more concerned about the housekeeping and the cooking, especially when he came home from work, when he would demand his dinner the instant he came in. One day after a hard day's work, he came home looking forward to a good dinner, which he expected to be cooked and ready, on the table for him to tuck into as soon as he walked through the door. Imagine his shock and annoyance when he discovered there was no dinner. In fact, there was no meat, no vegetables or potatoes or any other kind of food in the house at all. He was very, very angry and demanded to know why there was no meat or food of any kind in the house. Can't get meat from bare rock, his wife answered calmly, telling him, "'Tis wrong to give in to anger. Hard words won't butter parsnips.'" "'What good be your fancy spells if you cannot rustle up a sausage?' It will be the death of you if you do not find me some meat and dinner quick, he angrily told her. Then he sarcastically challenged her, telling her if she could put a meat dinner in front of him within half an hour, then he would believe in her great spells and power and would for all time be submissive to her will. This was a tall order indeed, for the nearest place she might find meat in those days was the market town of St Ives, a good five miles away. Still, the woman confidently put on her cloak and bonnet and began the journey. Her husband watched as she walked out of the door, down the garden path and out of the gate. He then watched her walk down to the bottom of the hill, where she placed herself on all fours on the ground. To his absolute astonishment, she disappeared and in her place sat a huge hare. 
Jumping up, the hare ran off down the road towards St Ives at incredible speed. Her astonished husband watched as it disappeared over the next hill on the road to St Ives. With no food in the house, he settled down thinking of how he would punish his wife once she had failed, which he was in no doubt she would. To his surprise, less than half an hour later, with a plate of good meat, potatoes and vegetables, she walked through the door and placed it on the table, ready for him to eat, which he did. But from that day onwards, he lived in fear of his wife and was completely submissive to her will until until the day she died. Now even witches die, and die she did a few years later, and it was said to be a most terrible death. It was said that as she lay dying, the room was full of demons and evil spirits and the shrieks and cries she made were terrible until death finally took her. The locals knew when she had died because a black cloud floated over her house while elsewhere and all around the skies were blue and sunny. At her funeral, her coffin was carried by six reluctant local men. As they bore her coffin from her home to the church, Halfway between, a hare sprinted out of the hedgerow and jumped right over the coffin. Understandably, this startled and frightened the men and they dropped the coffin in the road and ran off. The parson managed to persuade six others to take up the coffin and the funeral procession continued. As they proceeded towards the church, they had not gone far. A most strange thing happened. The hare suddenly appeared out of thin air, seated on top of the coffin, carried by the men. Once again, the coffin was dropped and the bearers ran off in fright. The parson consulted with the parishioners and at last another six reluctant men were found to bear the coffin. However, they would only do so on the condition that the parson went before them continuously, reciting the Lord's Prayer until the prepared grave was reached. This was done and the coffin reached its final destination without further incident. When they arrived, they placed the coffin on the ground and the parson began to give the usual burial service. To the shock of all, the hair materialised on top of the coffin again, just as the parson was saying, I am the resurrection and the life. With those words, the hair suddenly changed into a terrifying, black, terrifying beast with red glowing eyes like coals and let out the most unearthly and terrifying scream and disappeared into thin air, never to be seen again. And so ended the tale of the Witch of Trevor. So we also have the Booker, said to be a male sea spirit in Cornish folklore, a merman that inhabited mines and coastal communities as a hobgoblin during storms. The mythological creature is a type of water spirit likely related to the puka from Irish, the puka from Welsh folklore and the female Mary Morgans, a type of mermaid from Welsh and Breton mythology. It's been suggested that the puka had originally been an ancient pagan deity of the sea and there are records of food offerings made on the beach in the time of early or pre-Christian Britonic belief practices. In 1890, the Cornish folklorist William Bottrell stated that it is uncertain whether Booker can be regarded as one of the fairy tribe. Old people, within my remembrance, spoke of a Booker Gwydon and a Booker Do. By the former, they meant good spirit, and by the latter, an evil one, now known as Booker Boo. I have been told by persons of credit that within the last 40 years, it was a usual practice with Newlyn and Mousehole fishermen. So Newlyn's a fishing port and town and Mousehole a village in Cornwall to leave on the sand at night a portion of their catch for Booker. Probably from this observance, the common nickname of Newlyn Bookers was derived. An old rhyme says, Penzance boys up in a tree looking as wished, i.e. haunted, as wished can be. New Limbookers as strong as oak, knocking them down at every poke. Folklore investigations around the same time of Bottrell's findings show the Booker did indeed come in two forms. 
the booker widen, white booker, and the booker do, black booker. Booker also has association with the wind. That makes you think of Dick Van Dyke, the Mary Poppins song that's doing the rounds at the moment. How's it go? Winds in the east, mist coming in, like something is brewing about to begin. Thank you for that. In Penzance in Cornwall, it was customary to refer to storms that emanated from a southwesterly direction as the Booker Calling. Not Dick Van Dyke, but the Booker. Sailors and fishermen also believed that the Booker's voice carried on the wind. The Booker also holds association with being a tin mining spirit, so it has a wider origin of being just then of the sea. There are reports from the 19th century where fishermen would provide the booker with offerings, particularly fish that they would leave on beaches for them as outlined by Bottrell. The tale of the sea booker describes the booker inhabiting La Morna Cove in Cornwall, having the dark brown skin of a conga eel and a tangle of seaweed for hair and given to swimming in the waves, lying in the sea caverns or sitting among the rocks with the birds. He was a very lonely creature who had once been a human prince cursed by a witch, but was very fond of children. He assisted the Lamorna fishermen by driving fish into their nets and crabs into their pots, yet was capable of terrible vengeance, and so they avoided him by leaving a share of their catch on the beach to placate, to placate him. I can't say that word, placate him. During the 18th and 19th centuries, folklorists generally interpreted the popular beliefs and practices they found as survivals from or relics of Catholicism, equating such survivals with paganism. Some also saw the continuation of practices from pre-Christian times. This idea has been discredited in recent years by academic folklorists, although this notion persists in the popular imagination. So there is little surprise that the Reverend W.S. Latch Sersma, a British curate, historian and science fiction writer, he's actually credited as one of the first science fiction writers to use the word Martian as a noun. So he interpreted Booker as the storm god of the old Cornish and equated this figure with the devil. Yeah, that old chestnut. So parents would often frighten their children with tales of the book boo to frighten them into behaving and to get them to stop crying. I mentioned earlier the association with the booker and the mines, and this brings us to the knocker. So the knocker is a mythical subterranean gnome-like creature in Cornish and Devon folklore. Its Welsh counterpart is the Coblin Eye, and it is closely related to the Irish Leprechaun, Kentish Cloaker, and the English and Scottish Brownie. The Cornish described the creature as a little person, two feet tall, with a disproportionately large head, long arms, wrinkled skin, and white whiskers. It wears a tiny version of standard miners' clothes and commits random mischief, such as stealing miners' unattended tools and food. Other accounts of the knocker that I found states that they are ugly little beings, no more than knee height to an average sized man. They have large hooked noses, skinny limbs, mouths that stretch from ear to ear, and a love of pulling hideous faces. Cornish miners believed that the knockers beckoned them towards finding rich veins of tin. As miners changed from independent family-owned operators to hired labourers for large industrialised companies, there was, of course, increased concern for safety, reflected in the knocker's new role. They knocked on the mine walls to warn of impending collapse. Generally considered benevolent, they were also tricksters who would hide tools and extinguish candles. They are interpreted as being mine spirits, as in nature, earth-type spirits, or they could be the spirits of those killed in the mine. Many miners would cast the last bite of their pasties into the mines for the knockers to show appreciation, but also to avoid future peril. So I am going to explain what a pasty is because I know some of you listening are all over the world and may not have heard of it. So a Cornish pasty accounts for 6% of Cornish economy. 
And it's basically made up of a pastry type pocket that encases traditionally like beef, potato, swede, onion, all sorts. And then it's baked. It's all encased. So, of course, has always been the perfect lunch for miners and sailors and so on to just stick in their pocket. Can't be going Cornwall and not eating a pasty. So I read this on the amazing IC Sedgwick's blog, icsedgwick.com, who hosts the podcast Fabulous Folklore. You have to give that a listen. She actually has a whole episode on the knockers that I will post in the show notes. That just sounds like a carry-on film title. So um, she states that the knockers, sorry, she's... (laughs) She states that the miners wouldn't whistle whilst in a mine, lest they offend the knockers. But singing would be accepted. The miners also didn't wear crosses as these offended the knockers. You couldn't speak badly of them either, just in case they decided to cause any accidents. And if you were rude to them, you were considered a fool. It is said that if you heard knocking outside a mine, it prophesied death. And the person who heard it would be the one next to die. And knockers were either said to be spirits of Jews who were used as slaves in the mines or ghosts of those who weren't good enough for heaven but not evil enough for hell. So the knockers are believed to have come from early Welsh folklore and be the earliest inhabitants of Wales who taught the art of mining to the Brits. Yet, the knocker now tends to be more associated with Cornwall. Cornwall was notorious for its mining industry that went back around 4,000 years and they traded tin with the Romans. So if you're in America, this might ring bells with you in the form of the Tommy Knocker. So during the 1820s, immigrant Welsh and Cornish miners brought tales of the Tommy knockers and how they would steal unwatched items and give warning knocks. The underground elves became part of the folklore of miners throughout the American West, not just those of Cornish background too. When asked if they had relatives who had come to work the mines, the Cornish miners always said something along the lines of, Well, my cousin Jack over in Cornwall wouldst come, could you pay his boat ride? And so they came to be called Cousin Jacks. The Cousin Jacks refused to enter new mines until assured by the management that the knockers were already on duty. Even non-Cornish miners who worked deep in the earth where the noisy support timbers creaked and groaned came to respect the Tommy knockers. The American interpretation of knockers seemed to be more ghostly than elfish. So belief in the knockers in America remained well into the 20th century when one large mine closed in 1956 and the owners sealed the entrance. Fourth, fifth and sixth generation cousin Jacks circulated a petition calling on the mine owners to set the knockers free so that they could move on to other mines. Oh, the owners complied. So belief among Nevadan miners persisted amongst its miners as late as the 1930s. Back in Cornwall, the knockers are said to still reside within the mines, keeping an ever faithful watch, waiting for a day when they can once more guide the Cornish miners to the rich ore within. So the Cornish Pisky or Pixie. Hip and skip over dales and hills, pixie magic cures all ills. It will be your lucky day if you meet him on your way. It's a very musical episode today. Hope you liked that. That I didn't make that up. That is actually a thing. So we've had much talk of fairies upon the podcast, but the Cornish don't tend to refer to the fair folk as fairies. No, no, no. They are always the piskies or small people. One of the best known stories about the Piskies is of the lost child of St. Alan, a parish about four miles from Truro. And this is said to have occurred in a small hamlet of Trianike, or as it's now called, Trifronic. So here we go. On a lovely spring evening years and years ago, a small village boy wandered out to pick flowers in a little copse not far from his parents' cottage. 
His mother, looking from the kitchen door, saw him happily engaged in his innocent amusement, then turned to make ready the supper for her good man, whom she saw trudging home in the distance across the fields. When a few minutes later she went to call her boy in to his evening meal, he had vanished. At first it was thought that the child had merely wandered further into the wood, but after a while, when he did not return, his parents grew alarmed and went in search of him. Yet no sign of the boy was discovered. For two days the villagers sought high and low for the missing child, and then on the morning of the third day, to the delight of the distracted parents, their boy was found sleeping peacefully upon a bed of fern within a few yards of the place where his mother had last seen him. He was perfectly well, quite happy, and entirely ignorant of the length of time that had elapsed. And he had a wonderful story to tell. While picking the flowers, he said he had heard a bird singing in more beautiful tones than any he had heard before. Going into the wood to see what strange songster this was, the sound changed to most wonderful music which compelled him to follow it. Thus lured onward, he came at length to the edge of an enchanted lake and he noticed that night had fallen but that the sky was ablaze with huge stars. Then more stars rose up all around him and looking, he saw that each was in reality a pisky. These small people formed themselves into a procession singing strange fascinating songs the while and under the leadership of one who was more brilliant and more beautiful than the rest they led the boy through their dwelling place. This he said was like a palace. Crystal pillars supported arches hung with jewels which glistened with every colour of the rainbow. Far more wonderful, the child said, were the crystals than any he had seen in a Cornish mine. The Piskies were very kind to him and seemed to enjoy his wonder and astonishment at their gorgeous cave. They gave him a fairy meal of the purest honey spread on dainty little cakes. And when at last he grew tired, numbers of the small folk fell to work to build him a bed of fern. Then crowding around him, they sang him to sleep with a strange, soothing lullaby, which for the rest of his life he was always just on the point of remembering, but which has certainly escaped him. He remembered nothing more until he was awakened and taken home to his parents. The wise folk of St. Alan maintained that only a child of the finest character ever received such honour from the small people, and that the fact that they had shown him the secrets of their hidden dwelling argued that forever afterwards they would keep him under their especial care. And so it was, the boy lived to a ripe old age and prospered amazingly. He never knew illness or misfortune and died at last in his sleep. And those that were near him say that as he breathed his last, a strange music filled the room. Some say that the Piskies still haunt the woods and fields around Trifronic but they only wish to show themselves to children and grown-ups of simple, trusting nature. Anyhow, those that wish to try to see them may reach the place where the lost child was spirited away in an hour and a half's walk from Truro, Cornwall's cathedral city, which is at the head of one of the most beautiful rivers in the world. And that comes from Legendland being a collection of some of the old tales told in those western parts of Britain served by the Great Western Railway by George Basil Barham. So in essence, much of the West Country, so like Devon, Cornwall, Somerset and Dorset, is Pisky or Pixie territory, not just Cornwall. And it's said that this region was won by them after ferocious battles with other forms of the Fae. There are also said to be isolated colonies of the Pixies in East Anglia and Northern England, and at times, travelling Pixie fairs have also been seen in other regions of the UK. Pixies are said to be generally mischievous, not malevolent with how they deal with us human folk. They are, however, known for trapping people in grassy rings known as ghoul traps, or Pixie leading them by making people lost, even though they are in surroundings familiar to them. They live in pixie mounds, which are grassy hollow hills, but they also venture into rural dwellings from time to time. 
Some species of the pisky is said to be the Griggs, who like to live in and around apple orchards. And of course, the Booker, who we discussed, who likes the coast. There's also the Derricks, who are fond of the moors. Piskies are said to work alone. They are likened to little old men, all identical and no taller than your thumb, with faces that are weathered and beady little eyes similar to a mouse. They are smartly dressed and wear red caps, breeches, white shirts, brown coats, stockings and black proudly polished shoes with glistening, sorry, glinting silver buckles. They're said to be lively and chatty. Their chatter is said to be similar to the sound of a hive of bees. They prefer to be transported on the back of a snail I also discovered that the Pisky was said to have come to Cornwall from with the saints from Ireland, and others believe that the Pisky had once been gods of pre-Christian Cornwall that were originally giant in stature, but they had shrunk once sprinkled with holy water with the beginning of the new religion. That worked out quite well for the church, that idea, I think. So their favourite pastimes have been to wildly ride ponies by the cover of darkness, laughing maniacally. But for all the naughty things they are said to love to do, they do also do kind things, such as tending to farmers' fields and crops on moonlit nights, helping the elderly in their homes and carrying out chores for those who are suffering with illness. Their good spirit is said to outweigh their mischief. Piskies are said to be the good spirits of ancient Cornwall, but the Spriggans are said to be the bad spirits. The Spriggan is said to be bad to the core and have no redeeming features. They are said to guard every clifftop and granite cairn. So a cairn is a man-made stack of stones that were used for burial mounds. So when we used to be in Bodmin and go up onto the moors and go to a park called Brown Willie, stop laughing, I know you're laughing, as I used to when I was younger and that name came up. Still an immature child. Anyway, the cairns that were there were said to possibly be for an ancient king, again, like possibly from the Bronze Age, but there are a ton of these. And the Spriggans were said to guard these and also giant tombs known as dolmens and, you know, hundreds of ancient burial sites that were thought to contain treasures that had been buried alongside the remains of pagan people who populated the land's thousands of years ago. So Spriggans would guard these sites to protect the treasures within using either their evil grins, spitting, hissing, or whatever threatening means they could to warn people off. They're said to be strange and creepy in appearance with oversized heads on puny shoulders. Sounds a lot like one of my exes, only joking. And the Uh, or am I, and the appearance of a shriveled old man, they were said to raise storms to terrify lone travellers and summon hail and rain to ruin crops. They were also said to steal babies from their cradles and leave one of their own ugly large-headed brats in their place. So that's all I have for you today in regards to Cornish folklore. There is obviously a ton that we haven't covered, so it's well worth having a look into. But I'm going to leave you with a little story I have to tell you of the Moors. So when my mum was pregnant with my little brother, my mum and dad and I went up to Cornwall and stayed with my grandparents. They had just moved to a house in Blislands, in Bodmin, and their phone line wasn't up and running yet. So we're talking the 80s here, like no mobiles, nothing like that. And that night, my mum had some complications with her pregnancy, which was all fine. Like, you know, everything was fine in the end. But my dad was sent out to walk across the moors in the dead of night. And for some reason, he took me with him because everyone went there was looking after my mum. So we traipsed across the moors with me on his shoulders I was about two, like my dad would need scaffolding for that now. And we walked and got to the doctors. But the thought of knowing all I do about the moors, I have no idea how my dad had the balls to do that. Like, obviously it was essential, but the fear, like the fear of that just petrifies me. I I find that unreal because 
you've got like there's so many stories when you talk to people there of the beast of Bodmin Moor. So basically this wild cat that loads of people have claimed to see. To put it into perspective, okay, since the year 2000, there have been 205 sightings of the beast reported to the local old bill. That's reported sightings. And the reason I believe in the beast of Bodmin Moor is because there are Firstly, were a lot of people like 60s and 70s who had these wild cats, wild animals. You know, it was a trend, like it was a thing. And then certain laws were passed where people weren't allowed to keep them anymore. People in Cornwall and Devon and so on had the kind of land to own those animals. So a lot of them just let them go, like just let them free. And then also there was said to be a lady who had a lot of, did a lot of work in relation to wild cats. She had three cats, I think three or four that were on their way to another zoo, but she decided to let them just be free, like didn't want to put them in there anymore. And she claims that she let them loose upon the moors. And I think they survived. I think they're still out there. Like, I don't know, think what you want, but I'm not going to go out there on my own, especially not at night time. Add on top of that, the horror of that, you have the ghost of Charlotte Dimond, who was murdered in 1844 upon Bodmin Moor, and she is said to be seen often wearing her Sunday best. There is a ton of stories relating to the Moors, let alone just the Spriggans to contend with. I don't know how my dad did it, but hats off to him. So there is, like I say, a ton of folklore relating to Cornwall. I'm sure we'll get into some other aspects on the show. We will return to Cornish witchcraft. So I think that's really interesting, gives you an amazing insight into folk magic. So I want to give a huge, huge shout out to Jamie Lee Coomba, Kathleen Thomas, Kerry May Zagrabelna, Jessica, Sarah McNett, Sarah Ann Brady, Elizabeth Reza, Susanna Mogaji, and Rua O'Henry. Oh, and Miriam Watts. Thank you all for signing up recently to Patreon. Wow, there are so many of us now in the space of a month. It's crazy. I'm so grateful to all of you. If you want to connect with other witches along with myself, come on over to the White Witch Coven on Patreon. A lovely, lovely, lovely group of witches. Like you are all such lovely people. It's only six pounds a month. We have a little Mabon group call this week to discuss our plans, swap ideas, but also to discuss this next full moon and its themes. You can also pick up on their grimoire sheets for all of season two of the podcast, a ton of extra witchy content, as well as each month we have an exclusive Patreon podcast episode. So information for today's show came from Wikipedia, icsedgwick.com. I will add all of this in show notes and penwithi.co.uk. I will post all my socials into the show notes and anything that's related to this episode that I think might be worth a look at. I will be back with you all soon. Have a great week, witches. Sending you lots and lots of witchy love. (laughs) 